Yeah, and we've, I'm going to try to go through all of it um, fairly quickly in 45 minutes. Um, but I, as you'll see as I kind of go through this, um, hopefully you'll see that you know it is possible. You can do it. Um, and depending on what your BizDoc solutions look like on premise, um, you know, your mileage may vary in terms of effort involved to get there, but it is possible. So um, it's just uh, a quick introduction for me. So this is who I am. As uh, Saravana said, I'm a uh, nine-time BizTalk MVP or Microsoft Integration MVP. Um, I've just written a book, um, which I shall probably mention repeatedly over the next 45 minutes. Um, and what, I, what I'm going to do here really is uh, the final chapter of the book actually talks um, about this subject. So you know, it's obvious that um, you know, we've got a room full of people who are either using BizTalk or looking at using BizTalk or been using BizTalk for the last you know, 14 years, right? So um, I think it's, you know, it's an interesting area now when you have two things to choose from. When you go from BizTalk server on-premise to BizTalk services in the cloud, when do you use what? And I know other people are going to talk a little bit more about that than I am. I'm just really going to focus on how you can make that physical move from one to the other if you want to and if it makes sense, and I'll talk about that as well. So, you know, the final chapter, uh, chapter eight in the book, really goes through all of the different artifacts that you can create in BizTalk Server and the comparison with how you may do those things in Windows Azure BizTalk Services or Webs. Uh, just a couple of other things, you know, I'm a co-founder of um, a local partner in the UK and I'm not a Microsoft employee, so anything that, that I say, um, it is not necessarily Microsoft's view, or uh, I'm not representing them. <laughs> so, uh, right, I think I've covered this. So, 45 minutes. So, probably easy to ask, ask uh, questions at the end, um, given the time constraints we've got. Um, so, let's just quickly think about why you'd move. Um, there may be a number of reasons, right? You may have an aging BizTalk server estate. This is quite common because of the, you know, the number of releases of BizTalk, certainly since 2004. <laughs> Most people don't keep up with the latest version, at least not with all of their solutions. So as um, uh, Guru was saying, you know, there may be some forcing factors here, right? There may be the fact that the platform has gone out of support, you know, um, uh, Windows, SQL Server, et cetera, and you have to move. And when you have to move, when you have to upgrade, you can consider whether it still makes sense to upgrade to the next version of BizTalk, and depending on which version of BizTalk you're currently on, say you're on 2006, there may be some significant effort in just moving to the BizTalk 2013 if you're using some of the old SCP adapters, the non-WCF-based adapters. <laughs> there may be some effort there. So, you know, it may be an opportunity to look at maybe I can cloud-enable some of my integration efforts. Maybe I can, uh, I, I can get some benefits from, from doing this. So, you know, there's obviously the, the kind of cloud economics of this, you know, not just the fact this is the cool and trendy thing to do, but there are good business reasons why you might want to do it as well. And, you know, probably the main one is, is around lowering costs and complexity. So today, you know, you manage BizTalk server farms on premise in your own data centers. It's, uh, it, it can be a, a, you know, a reasonable amount of work. You typically have people dedicated just to looking after those environments and keeping them running, you know, server patching um, and, and managing and monitoring that environment. Um, it's typically a full-time job for somebody, or maybe more than one person. It's a 24-7 job as well, oftentimes. So, it, you know, when you move to uh, BizTalk Services or the cloud model, you know, the, the, the Azure um, Application Services model, a lot of that infrastructure management, monitoring, patching, building, and provisioning, and all of that good stuff is all kind of done for you, right? You can focus on um, the, the, the platform as a service model where you're just creating solutions and deploying them to Azure. And that just cuts out a lot of the stuff that's really just, just the overhead of running a BizTalk environment. So, you know, there may be sound reasons for doing it. The architecture of BizTalk server has remained relatively static for very good reasons for the last 10 years. Um, a lot of reasons for that, of course, is that if it's changed fundamentally, you know, you decided to take the message box out of this thing, as they've done in BizTalk services, you're going to break a whole load of stuff. So it's just not feasible to change things. So um, you know, there may be other types of messaging patterns which may be more appropriate for BizTalk services and BizTalk server. And by modern development, I'm talking about uh, some of the improvements made in BizTalk services, such as the new um, uh, transformation engine, which is just a really nice experience. And the product group tried to make the things that were hard in the BizTalk mapper traditionally easy in the BizTalk services transformations. So you know, there, are, there are advantages and potentials for faster delivery on BizTalk services as well. And then, of course, you know, the cloud stuff, the flexible scale, the fact that uh, BizTalk services is provisioned in terms of units rather than servers. So you just kind of move this slider up and down in the BizTalk, um, in, sorry, in the Azure management portal and say, you know, I want to go from one of these things to four of these things. 
depending on my workloads that I'm expecting. And I can, up, I can scale up and down as appropriate and just pay for these things <coughs> as I use them rather than having to deal with peak load scenarios on premise where maybe I have to have half a dozen BizTalk servers and the associated clusters SQL and everything else just to deal with those peak load scenarios which may only happen once a month. You know, I can deal with that in a different way <coughs> when I'm using the cloud. Okay. So, you know, there, there are going to be some challenges though, right? BizTalk Services is not the same as BizTalk Service. It's, if you want something that's the same as BizTalk Server in the cloud, then you can host BizTalk Server in the cloud and just move your solutions there and run them there instead. And uh, other, uh, I think Stephen Thomas is going to talk about it later. So, um, I really want to look at the sort of the, you know, the approach here as, a, as an 80-20 rule. So, what, if you want to move your solutions from BizTalk Server to BizTalk Services, then, um, you know, you need to know what's different what's similar um, and, uh, and what's, what's the same, you know, what you can just take as is or maybe with some tooling can just convert and run in a business service environment. So I'm going to focus on first uh, the things that are similar or, or, or much the same and then we're going to move to the kind of hard stuff. And obviously the things I'm going to talk about first, I'll get the good answers for and we're going to talk about later, are going to be harder. And I'm going to show some stuff on how you can, uh, how you can uh, tackle some of these things as well. It's all doable, it just comes down to the amount of effort involved doing it and that comes down to the value prop of moving the business services or Azure or cloud model at all. Right? You know, the payback may not be immediate, the payback may be over a number of years. Um, certainly given that uh, typically, you know, from my experience, business server solutions can run you know, for a decade. You know, it's just people run these things, people implement them and they just forget about them and just keep implementing more and more interfaces over time and you end up with you know, a larger state of things that you know, often doesn't cause you very many problems. You just kind of, you just, you just runs your business and you, and you forget about it. Um, okay, so yeah, so in the in the medium to long term, you know, making that investment, taking those opportunities to, to move to business services may be a good idea. Okay, so you know, I, was, I put this slide there together over the last few days, and I was kind of thinking, well, I should throw up a, a classic business server architecture. So I kind of typed it into Google and get this nice set of images from like ages ago. I found it quite funny, so I put one up from two thousand and four. I think uh, you know, a bunch of us did, did tech it back then, and we all kind of put together these diagrams and somebody said, no, no, we should have one diagram. And this is kind of the one that everybody was using, this one that was using them at the end. And it shows the kind of classic model with the message box in the middle, the center of the universe. Messages come in through ports and adapters, through pipelines, and then they get published into this message box and then subscriptions off of that, they also send ports to send messages out to them. Another adapter in the pipeline, or whether it goes to orchestration. You know, it's sort of a, a, a not complete, but certainly um, a fairly comprehensive list of all the different artifacts you can have in this server. Ports, pipelines, maps, orchestration, rules, etc., etc. So there's a whole bunch of things that you can include in a business project that don't necessarily have an exact match in business services. Okay. So probably one of the most fundamental things that uh, people use in business server is mapping. You know, this and orchestration are probably the two most used things because they're the graphical tools. They're the ones that are meant to have the most productivity. Um, and mapping is fundamental for integration because. It, uh, it allows you to kind of uh, take the imperfect world that you live in and convert one format to another. So you know, wouldn't it be great if, if uh, everybody in the same industry all used the same standards? It's just, it's just, not, it's just not the case. You need to take one message format, you need to transform it to another message format, you need to enrich that message, you know, add properties <coughs> to it, change it, and then send it on to somebody else. Maybe you need to canonicalize those messages so you get messages in from a number of different partners, and you need to make the changes to them to a single format, you then do some, do some business processing on that, and then you send that on, and you send it on to another, you know, another set of partners, maybe sort of some content-based content, uh, routing mechanism. So mapping is kind of fundamental, and, uh, and I think the product kind of got that because it's one of the things that uh, you know was uh, produced in the preview of BizTalk Services, um, and uh, and it's one of the areas that's received a significant amount of investment, I'd say, because it's it's a really nice graphical mapping experience. And, uh, and it has a lot of improvements in the way it works, rather than having the kind of some of the twisted <coughs> contortions you have to do in the BizTalk mapper with various functoids just to do simple if and else structures are very, very simple in the, in the BizTalk services mapper. Um, so there are two general approaches that you can use when you've got existing maps in BizTalk server that you can move to BizTalk services. And uh, the first one is that, that uh, the BizTalk services um, mapper, or the 
transforms also support XSLT, just like Bistle Server does. So if you're just using straight XSLT man, <coughs> you can take those and you can run those most of the time just in Bistle services with no drama. I mean, you can even you know, use the extensibility features of a bridge to actually just run that XSLT directly inside the bridge as well, you know, if, you, if there was anything that uh, wasn't quite supported. But you know, there's very low effort to just take these maps and run them in Bistle services. Now, the other thing you can do if you want to move to that new world and you want to start enriching and changing these maps is um, you, can, uh, you can convert the map, the BTM files in Bizlook Server to Bizlook Services. And, uh, and there's a map conversion tool that lets you do that. So what I'm going to show now is, is quickly how that works. Um, so I have a map right here. So this is a, just a standard um, Bizlook Server map. Uh, you know, scheme on the left-hand side, scheme on the right-hand side, a whole bunch of font toys in the middle with lots of lines connecting them together. You know, I've got some scripts in here, I've got uh, basically some looping going on, so I've got some cum accumulation where I'm spinning around the, uh, the, the price node in the products, and I'm going to add them all together, and then I'm going to send it out to an order value on the right-hand side. You know, fairly standard stuff, you know, you know not trivial, but, uh, but not too complex either. Um, and I can use this... this um, uh, this mapping conversion tool that's provided in the SDK for Bizlook services. And uh, I'll just pull this up. So this is the command line tool that I run. And oops, basically, you know, you'll just run the executable, you know, uh, the uh, uh, BTM to TRFM converter, <coughs> and I pass in the Bizlook map, you know, the, the, this flat file to US. Um, uh, thing that I've got here, this, this map from Bizlook server. And when I run that, um, I can obviously provide you know, an output location as well, but I don't do that, it just dumps it in the same location as, as the Bizlook map. And you know, it looked like it did something, right? So if I uh, go across to uh, Windows Explorer, you can see, and I've got it sorted in date order, right at the top here is this, this TRFM file that's been created by um, this tool. If I just delete that, just to prove that uh, it really did do it, and uh, run it again. There, and there it is. Right, so, let's have a look at it. Now, I've done this one deliberately to show you uh, some of the things that can happen when you convert a map. So, it's maybe a bit hard to read with this resolution, so bear with me a second while I shrink some stuff down. Uh, I'll create a new Bistock service. I'll call it Bistock Service 11, because, uh, that's my name from the convention. And right. I do that. So I've just got a blank project. And I'm going to add in that map file that I just created. So let's just spin back here. Grab the path of this thing. Paste it in here. Right, there it is. Now, oops. When I open this, there's an error. <coughs> So the map tool's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, this error is, this, this error is, this error is, I mean, I, I knew this was going to happen, so, so I'll just show you how trivial this is. So if I open this up um, in code format, you, you sometimes have this issue where the IDs get uh, duplicated, and that's because I've got a whole bunch of script in the original pistol map. So, you know, you just got to look for these things and give them a different value. I'm only showing you this because this is this, this is you know one of those the moment of disappointment when you take your Bistle maps and you run them and then you go oh it didn't work first time so I'm just literally just changing that script ID from 15 to 14 as it showed there and now let's go back to the solution before I open it Ooh. I wasn't expecting that. Never seen it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a complex project, so if it is buggy, please come and fix it. Right. <laughs> hey, what's it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, she mentioned that. It is, it is a, a tool what provided by the product group, but not supported by the product group. Is that right? It's complex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah right. So in all of the demos that I knew weren't going to work, this wasn't one of them. I think I have one I did earlier. Oh, that. 
Yes. Right, I forgot one. Okay, okay, right, let's just get rid of this. <coughs> Screen furniture over here. Right. Um, I need to play around the formatting a little bit, just so you can sort of see what's going on. Maybe not quite that much. Uh, let's just drag some of, these, some of these things around. So you see, you know, I've got a, I've got a script here, so it's taken that across. Um, another one there. This this guy should be right over the right hand side. Let's just tidy it up a little bit. Um, but fundamentally, this is exactly the same. You know, it's done a really good job of just converting that map, all the looping, all the aggregation, and all the, everything, and it will just run absolutely fine, just with those minor tweaks. Um, you know, things look quite different here because of the way the BizTalk Services Mapper has been kind of reinvented for BizTalk Services, where I now have this idea of being able to nest um, these functoids or, or nest these these operations, right? So I've got this container, and I can wire up a container to a set of nodes on the left hand side on the input. And then the container basically is like a for each construct, which will, which will automatically kind of go through all the nodes in the message. And then I can put things inside that which act upon each one of those individual instances as in that runs. Um, so although it looks a little bit different, it's, it's you know, functionally exactly the same map. So you know, that's, that's one thing that's um, you know, really useful when you're, uh, when you're looking at being able to reuse artifacts from um, Bizzle server, Bizzle services. The other kind of uh, associated thing with that is that Bizzle services support schema just like Bizzle server does. So you can take your existing schemas, your existing maps, and you can convert, this, convert the maps and put them in a Bizzle services solution and just run them, you know, deploy them on your bridges, and, uh, and that should be fairly straightforward. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Okay, right, pipelines. Uh, next up, so, um, <coughs> so I'm going to try and go through all of this, which may be challenging. Um, pi pipelines, so to me, the, 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 the closest kind of cousin of pipelines of business services is, is the bridge. A bridge is um, a kind of a funky combination of, um, of uh, message processing with pipeline processing together. Um, but the way a, a bridge works is it has a set of stages just like a Bizzle pipeline does. It has extensibility points just like a Bizzle pipeline does. Um, so it allows you to do things like message validation, um, you know, working out the, the message type from the, from the schemas that you configure on that bridge, just like Bizzle server does. Um, and then it, it lets you put mapping on those pipelines as messages kind of flow in and out of this thing. Um, and you, know, you can have custom codes so, you know, akin to pipeline components in Bizzle server, you can write your own and plug those into this. If there's anything that uh, the out of the box uh, pipelines or uh, bridges don't do for you, so the the, the bridges are kind of um, a, a static, if you like. There's really only two types at the moment, which is an XML and non-XML pass-through bridge, um, and you just configure each one of the stages on that, very similar to what you do with an XML, you know, disassembling pipeline in BizTalk. Um, so so again, there's a fairly close match with BizTalk services, BizTalk. So put it another way, you know, if you have fairly standard pipeline processing in your BizTalk solutions, then it should be fairly easy to take those and convert them to bridges. Maybe um, have to re-implement those pipeline components if you're doing anything, anything too clever, and then just put it in your bridge and deploy it. Okay, one other thing I mentioned about bridges, which is uh, kind of interesting, is bridges can pull other bridges, which you know you can do with pipelines in BizTalk, but uh, that's kind of a non-trivial thing to do, right, when you start running pipelines inside orchestrations and that kind of stuff. Doing it in BizTalk services, I think, is going to become very common, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later when you look at how uh, the service bus integration has been added on both sides of a bridge now. <coughs> so we had it on, as a destination in BizTalk services, now we have it as a source as well. And that allows you to very easily chain bridges together to create more complex uh, messaging patterns, <coughs> which you can't do with a single bridge alone. Okay, so you know, just a little graphical um, kind of comparison between these two, these two things. On the left-hand side, we've got a, got a classic BizTalk receive and send pipeline, and then we've got this bridge, which is kind of the same. So two columns of, of stages, and the message kind of goes all the way down to these stages. You know, you, you decode, disassemble, um, you know, the, the validation, etc. And then you go to the message box, and then you kind of go on and, on and go back out again. You do the same sort of uh, function, you know, functionality in reverse. The bridge is very similar to that. Except there's no message box. You know, this thing sort of flows through, and then it goes out through a destination, which could be, you know, it's at the endpoint when you're integrating with a web service, or it could be a service bus queue. You know, sorry, a relay, for example, so you're waiting for a response. You know, if there's a two-way bridge, um, so you know, very similar message flow where things go in, they kind of go through this processing pipeline, 
go out to the destination, you wait for a response, you get a response back, and you send the message back to the caller. Okay, right. Uh, I'm kind of covering this in no particular <coughs> order um, uh, because this is another area which has got uh, good tooling support for migration. So, um, training partner management is associated with EDI processing in BizTalk. Um, so one of the uh, one of the likely things is when you're when you're looking at um, you know evaluating BizTalk services, how do I take you know the 10,000 partners that I've got set up in BizTalk Server, and how do I run those EDI uh, processing workloads in BizTalk services? Right, I don't really want to have to put all that stuff back in again, all these people's contact details or phone numbers and all the various EDI setups for uh, fact X12, you know, the, the different identifiers they use, you know, all that stuff, I don't really want to do that again. So uh, Bizzle Services provides a migration tool for this. So the, the uh, training partner management in Bizzle Server 2010-2013 uh, is compatible with Bizzle Services. So if you're already on that version of, or those versions of Bizzle Server, you can take, I think it's only officially supported from 2013, but it does work from 2010, from my memory. Um, you can take those uh, definitions and you can move them to Bizzle Services and you can run your EDI workplace in Bizzle Services <coughs> instead. Okay, so let's, uh, let's have a look at how that looks. Here's a Bizzle Server Management Console. I'm going to expand this thing out. I've got these parties. And I've just got a couple of <coughs> parties I've got set up. Acme and Widgets Limited. And I've got a trading partner, oops, I've got a trading partner agreement between these two things. Right? So I want to take this and I want to migrate this to Bizzle <coughs> Services. How do I do that? Uh, well, there's a, uh, another tool uh, provided in the SDK, and this is the uh, trading button management tool, so make sure you can see this. And what this does is um, just guide me through the process of pointing to my Bizzle server environment and then asking me to select you know, what partners, what training agreements I want to migrate to Bizzle services. So if, just quickly before I do that, to show you know, this is a live demo and therefore probably won't work. Uh, over here, uh, I have the Azure portal. Uh, I've got the Bizzle Services portal. And if I just sort of refresh this, let it think about it for a minute, you can see that I've got no partners and I've got no agreements set up. So I've kind of got this blank Bizzle Services <coughs> that I've created. Uh, yes. Okay, I shall come back to that when the network uh, comes back. Um, but I'll just quickly go through the first part. So, you know, I've got my SQL Server's just local host is, you know, running my local machine. I've got use Windows Authentication. Click Next. Then I've got the deployment details, which is my business services instance in the cloud. So, you know, I have to put in the endpoint URL for that thing, which is, you know, the name that I give it when I create it. And I have to put in my ACS details, my credentials, basically. And then what it's going to do is it goes out to goes out of my Bizzle services instance and connects to that um, and uh, it allows me to pick which partners and which agreements I want to migrate. And if there's, you know, the reason it connects first is it wants to get a list of those to make sure there's no duplicates, etc. Um, and then I can just pick the ones I want to take and I just next, next, next all the way through this thing and it will create them in Bizzle services for me. Uh, there's a Wi-Fi doing Not good. <coughs> Okay, let's move on. You will have to take my word on that. <laughs> okay, right, now for the tough stuff. So, let's just quickly recap before I move on. So we've got schemas, we've got maps, uh, we've got trading partners and agreements we set up, and all of this stuff is fairly easy to do in business services. Uh, pipelines as well, you know, you can convert those to bridges. And if you're, so what that means is, you know, for straight messaging solutions, Things aren't too bad, you know. If you really, if you really want to move your business solutions to business services, it's not a huge amount of effort. You know, it's not a total rewrite from the ground up. This thing, um, even you know, don't forget that uh, you know one thing I should mention is because of the extensibility points with being able to add code into your bridges. You know, if you've got a pipeline component, there's a whole load of stuff which is ancillary to uh, the Bizzle API, if you like, and be going off and, and uh, doing some calculations or whatever. Then that should just move straight across as well. You just put it in a class, compile it up, and stick it in a message inspector in the bridge, and it will just work fine. Um, so, you know, that's, that's uh, quite a good score of the story, I think, so far, that you can move these things fairly easily to Bizzle services. But, I think it's fair to say that most most uh, business solutions use orchestration. I think you know this is a, probably a legacy thing, but uh, you know, it's the one thing that looks the coolest thing when you you know you, you first build a business environment. You go, oh, well, this flowchart thing. This is really cool. I'm going to drag and drop all these shapes and instead of um, thinking about what I'm actually trying to create. 
and uh, really just a straightforward messaging solution with a bit of content based routing with some property <coughs> proofing, etc. I'm going to do all that in orchestration. I'm going to mean, write loads of code, I'm going to put it all in my orchestration. Um, I think over time, lots of guidance has been produced to, to minimize that, but you know, talking about legacy solutions, I think there are a lot of cases that use orchestration unnecessarily, but also a lot of cases that use orchestration because it's the way to get a job done. Right? When, you, when you think about um, uh, you know, the various messaging patterns in a scatter gatherer, et cetera, where you want to fan things out maybe dynamically to a number of endpoints and then uh, collate all the responses back and create another message to go on to another party. These types of things are typically done in orchestration because it is that coordination of work um, that you need to do. Maybe, you, maybe you're uh, you know, waiting on an event uh, and uh, you want to time out on that event after a certain time. The orchestration is the pattern to do this. So uh, you know, it's an important uh, piece of the puzzle. So, um, but it's a hard problem to solve because there's no direct equivalent in BizTalk services, right? Um, and, uh, and the ODX files, you know, uh, Xlang, is, is um, <coughs> it's quite a complicated thing. Uh, so, so what can we do? So uh, with the architecture in Windows as a BizTalk service is being fundamentally different to BizTalk server. Um, and although workflow is planned in BizTalk services for the future, you know, that's not necessarily going to give me a way of running my orchestrations in BizTalk services. So how do I take those things? And how do I migrate those? Well, I'm just completely rewriting that. And what if I did rewrite it, what would I rewrite it in? Right. Um, well, you know, what I'm going to show here is, is just a little example of that, something we've been working on. Um, and, uh, and this actually takes bits of orchestrations and can migrate those to uh, Windows Workflow. And it'll automatically host that and provision that in Azure and connect that up to Service Bus. And if the Wi Fi network is working, I might be able to show you some of that. But what I am going to show you is, uh, is a couple of examples. So. Let's go back to uh, BizTalk. Um, yeah. Let's have a look. So if I just, I'll just add one to this project, why not? So I've got an existing demonstration. And uh, I'm just going to grab the path for this thing. Demonstrations. Those say something really simple to start off with. And those say something really complicated. You can't see what I'm doing, I'm just trying to find my little <coughs> pack of orchestrations that I've got. So let's just open this guy up. Really simple, right? This is the classic, you know, uh, the first orchestration everybody writes, pulls a file from file system and, uh, and puts it on the file somewhere else in the file system, right? This is a bit like that, but I'm going to do it over HTTP. So I'm basically going to um, just create, you know, basically a service endpoint where uh, I can post a message into this thing and get a reply back. And then in the middle of this thing, uh, which opened in my other monitor over here. In the middle of this thing, I'm just going to you know, create a new message from the input message. I'm going to put hello in front of it. So, if I open another command window here, and just tidy things up a little bit. <coughs> Okay, right, so I've got this little uh, utility, this orchestration converter utility, and here I'm just passing in this simple org.odx file, right? And then I'm just going to pump it out to an output file. So let's see what this does. So I run this, uh, it was written to that folder uh, successfully. So let's show you that folder and see what it did. Right, okay, so it created three things. Uh, the first thing uh, that's interesting in creating is the workflow, is Analytics file, so I'm going to workflow 4. Uh, and then it also noticed that you know, I had some code in this thing, right, in this expression shape. And the way it deals with that is it creates um, custom activities and, and compiles those up to an assembly, so you have to kind of reference that as well. Uh, but what it means is, you know, I can, um, I can open up another instance of Visual Studio and completely ruin my machine. I've got 12 on that already. If I Move this over here, and let's do again. Uh, okay, actually, yes. Let's just create a. Just make sure I've got the right references. I'm just going to create a workflow service project, and I'm going to add in the workflow that I just created. So, uh, add existing item. Thing. Let's grab that. Oops. Okay, I'm going to add in my workflow. 
And I'm going to add a reference to that assembly <coughs> generator as well. <coughs> right. So, let's do that. Let's get rid of that and let's try and open this and uh, see what happens. Right. That might have worked. So, stretch things around a bit. Okay, the world's most exciting orchestration converted to the world's most exciting workflow. So what I've got here is I've just got a request reply, set of activities in Windows workflow, and I've got this thing in the middle which is my custom activity, which is a code activity with that code in it that's going to stick the word hello on the front of the message I pass in. Right? It's very conversion, right? So let's try running this thing. So just to show it actually does do the same thing. So if it were to start I'm just going to use a WCF. Uh, uh, debugger, so uh, do, 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 debug, start new instance, and uh, this is just going to open the client that lets me post a message to this thing. It's going to error because I've got a whole bunch of stuff in my machine with config that I don't care about. And here's my simple awk with the you know endpoint that I can call to, and it says you know you've got a string you can pass in. So you know, if I put in the word John in there and hit invoke, hello John, <laughs> ran my workflow. All over. As I said, you know, <laughs> so you know that's interesting, right? So let's um, let's look at something a little more complicated. Uh, let's go back. Let's go back. To, uh, another, this sort of project I can add some stuff to. Let's add it to this one. System item. Okay, and then this is the dump back to something that's a little bit more uh, involved. So, it's another bit of orchestration. A little bit longer, this one. You know, notice I'm kind of receiving a message and then receiving another one, so we've kind of got some correlation going on there. Uh, <coughs> then I've got uh, uh, listen, so, you know, I'm basically. Um, making a decision based on a delay shape, so whether I'm going to um, time out waiting for uh, that second message to arrive, you know, I'm going to go down a different path. I've uh, got a whole bunch of error handling in this one, which is always good. Uh, you know, more expressions, just setting messages up, you know, I'm not going to go through all the details of this, and then kind of decide at the end where I'm going to basically branch out depending on, you know, certain conditions, right? So, you know, it's a little bit more real world than probably the first one was. So, uh, let's see what happens when I throw this one at the tool. So, I've never run this one on this one before, so we'll just have to see what happens. <laughs> okay. It's probably right. So the other thing I have to do is I have to pass in. I have to pass in the actual assembly that contains the orchestration. The reason for that is because it's a bit more real world. It's got a bunch of types in there because it's got a bunch of schemas in there. The schemas compile the types that go to that orchestration assembly. So I need to reference that stuff as well. So my workflow knows all the different types of messages coming in and out of this thing. So um, I'm just going to find that, which is yet another instance of Visual Studio. Uh, Let's convert. Here we go. Let's just build that. <coughs> and I'll pass in a reference to this chat. Uh, <coughs> excuse me for a moment while I try and find everything. Grab the path of that assembly and pass it into the parameter. We'll see if that works, and I might have to. Uh, some other stuff ends up. Right. Okay. Ah, oh, that's better. Okay, trying to do this, trying to do that, and it output the workflow successfully. So let's try and add that one to my workflow project. And add existing item. A whole bunch of stuff here. You know, there's loads of classes here because there's loads of expression shapes, all the coding that will do various different things. 
but you know somewhere in here there should be a parallel.nox file. So let's open that. And yeah, okay. So we've got a we've got a listen here, a couple of branches right with a delay in one of them and some other stuff in the other one. We're going to receive a second correlated message. Oops. Oh, let's skip over that. Uh, I've got one that looks better than that. <laughs> um, Because what I did was I took the workflow from one project and the assembly from another project and then kind of bolted them together, which is why it's not resolving the references for those activities. So it's not because it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, uh, so this looks better. There's my listen, a couple of branches, all kinds of stuff going on. It's kind of harder to read in the workflow format simply because of the way the designer kind of displays this stuff. But you know, I've got a loop. I kind of basically got everything that I had in the original orchestration converted to a workflow. So uh, I think you know when you look at adding all the business process management features that were announced, uh, you know the November summit in, in Seattle, um, it's going to be done in a different way. I think you're going to end up with the same capabilities, but they're going to be different, right? Because they, and you hope they're going to be better, right? Really. Um, so you know, uh, uh, workflow you know is arguably more flexible than orchestration, right? and provided that, that you get all of the all of the activities and everything else. Required to build the same things you build with orchestration. So certainly, all the meshing patterns. Then, <laughs> what's the problem, right? And I think, I think that's really the way the way to look at it. Um, that's why I'm sort of showing this and, and the tools that you know, Microsoft provide. You know, obviously, it's orchestration further to show that it's possible. You know, if you want to move to that new world and get the benefits of that new world, and then kind of move forward from there. I think if you want to carry on running orchestration, you're going to have this business legacy when really you'll realise the full benefits. You know, honestly, you'll realise the full benefits by building everything from the ground up from scratch. But you know you want an easy way if you've got existing uh, legacy solutions that are the business services. Okay. Um, so you know it's, there's still lots going on here, right? So one of, probably one of the most uh, 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 one of the most common things, I guess, in the way business services being used is implementing a number of different missing patterns. And you know uh, the, the, there's a good job done many years ago on uh, aligning uh, all the different uh, messaging patterns from that you know, black book written by um, uh, uh, the uh, think tech guys. Yes, yes. Taking, yes. Taking, the, taking all of that and being able to implement all of this service. So the obvious question, obvious question is, I'm speaking very fast now, the obvious question is, um, how can I implement all those patterns and business services? And I think you know, some of them are fairly straightforward, content-based routine. You know. uh, some things aren't, you know, but the reason I want to mention this is because I think with the some of the subtle uh, improvements, if you like, and I call them subtle because they're not immediately obvious, with the updates from last week on having a service bus receive and a topic receive, means that some of these patterns are, are now implementable. You know, one of the most uh, common ones in BizTalk is you receive one message, you send out three messages, right? You can't do that with a bridge today. Because you have one message and you've got to decide out of all the destinations where you're going to send it to. And you put in routing rules and you say, you know, if it's country code is US, I'm going to send it here. If it's Europe, I'm going to send it here. Um, when you add in the topic <coughs> subscription capabilities on the receive side, you can obviously have the same message consumed by multiple bridges. So now you can chain bridges together. So you can have one bridge that maybe does some work, does some transformation, and publishes it out. And then you can have three bridges that all consume exactly, basically, I mean, obviously it's copies of the message, but consumes those messages and then sends it out to three different locations rather than just one of three locations. And this is kind of what I'm kind of showing here, where I've got a bridge either side of my workflow. Right? So you know what you saw with the uh, with the template um, uh, uh, picture earlier is it kind of shows this U shape of, of messages coming in and going out again. But think of it more lack, more flat than that, where I've got a one way pattern where I've got a receive pipeline, classic pistol pattern. I've got a receive pipeline, some orchestration in the middle of the send pipeline. This is kind of how you do it. You'd have two bridges. You'd have one bridge that gets it from one source, maybe FTP, does a load of work with it. Uh, passes it on through service bus to a workflow that I'm hosting. You know, I was hoping to show this, but this is the Wi-Fi is just not working. I, I actually have a workflow subscribing to that topic. So now I've got a bridge publishing a message out, which is receiving over one transport, going to an going to a workflow, the converted orchestration, <coughs> and then that when that finishes its work, it publishes it back out to another uh, topic, uh, which fires another bridge, which completes the work and maybe sends that off to another FTP location or whatever, or an SAP system on premise. So again, you know, this is sort of 
you've got to think a little bit laterally with some of these things in terms of how you implement these messaging patterns. But I think the update last week on, on having full service us support on both sides of the bridge is really fundamental to some of these patterns and makes this a lot easier. When you add in, like, say, the extensibility <coughs> to, the, to the bridges as well, you know, you can do an awful lot now with Blizzard services. Okay, right, I've really run out of time, which is good, because um, I don't have a good answer for this one. <laughs> so, uh, another uh, commonly used feature in Visual Server is BAM, Business Activity Monitoring. And this is something, you know, I'm just gonna say is being announced by the product group, but will be coming in Visual Services. The other thing I would say is BAM really doesn't break a solution because it's missing, unless you've actually got dependencies on the activities that are being written to BAM. <coughs> Usually it's that thing that kind of is, it's, it's, it's Information about the processing, which you which you look at later in you know, nice pie charts and things. So the lack of BAM doesn't necessarily stop you from moving to business services, and the fact that tracking <coughs> is there is present in business services means you do have some element of uh, instrumentation for your uh, for your uh, workloads. Uh, the other thing I'd say is you know uh, the other thing you can do. Somebody's actually written an MSDN paper on this, um, which I was just looking around yesterday. Um, is you can use Bizzle Server, so you can put a you can put a web service in front end of Bizzle Server and uh, for BAM and just and just uh, write these activities from a WAVs bridge to BAM on premise if you want to use BAM. And BAM often spans multiple platforms or systems anyway, so WAVs is just another one. Right? So just use that in combination with Bizzle Server. I think this is you know another you know uh, important aspect of looking at what makes sense when you move things around. Is Bizzle Server plus Bizzle Services actually is really quite interesting. You know, there may be many reasons why you can't move a whole solution to business services um, and, uh, and you just uh, use a hybrid type of approach and business service plus business services play really well together on that basis. Okay, business rules engine is another area which um, uh, again, kind of strategies rather than tools now. It's another area which has been uh, committed to by the product group at some point in the future for, for business services. Um, some things you, you, know, you can do is you can use workflow rules, and you can actually convert uh, BRE rules to workflow rules depending on what they're doing fairly easily again, and then you can run those in the workflow as I've shown here. You know. So you know, one solution for that. Or you could expose, you know, depending on licensing, etc. you could expose uh, your business rules engine on-premise or, you know, or even the cloud-hosted version of business server and just post into that with your message data and it'll run the rules and come out again. So again, it's kind of a hybrid approach, you know, partial move rather than full move. So where, where are we? So you know what I've gone down is the, the, the list of features in Bizzle Server and the equivalents in Bizzle Services. And, you know, I've tried to put a graphic next to each one showing the effort involved in, uh, in moving you know, one to the other. So you see maps and schemas, very low effort. There's tooling provided. Schemas are just supported out of the box anyway. Pipelines and adapters. Uh, well, pipelines, you know, bridges are, are a good um, architectural equivalent, uh, again, with extensibility. Adapters, well, that kind of depends, right? There's 300 plus adapters for Bizzle Server and not so many for Bizzle Services. And as Guru said, you know, a very important next step for Bizzle Services is going to be add that extensibility API for the adapter SDK so people can build their own. And again, I think that will help, uh, you know, uh, plug the gaps because otherwise you, you end up in this hybrid again where um, you, you may be uh, wanting to do some processing in business services and then you push it down to one premise and use business services adapters. You know, there'll be very some common cases for that where you've got an existing business adapter which connects to a line of business system that's not supported by the um, uh, the, the business uh, adapter services, right? You know, some of the HIS stuff, for example, connected to the mainframes, MQ series, whatever. Um, you could actually just use a bridge to connect down to business on premise and then use adapt for the business to connect to the systems concern. And then we kind of go down to orchestration. Well, that's kind of not there yet, but you know, it's coming in terms of workflow. And you see, you know, it is possible to do a structural conversion from one to the other. Uh, business rules engine, yes, yeah, that's coming as well. Um, that, that, you know, depending on whether you're using that or not, may be more or less of a problem, right? And then bam, and tracking, tracking's there. Bam uh, is, is again you know, something of a roadmap. Yeah, so when you put it all together, you know, uh, you may think that you know, when the opportunity arises, start to move things around, maybe to get better agility, better scale, uh, lower cost, you know, by moving some of these workloads from business over to business services. Um, as I explained, you know, putting bridges on the other side of the workflow creates some interesting patterns, and we have service bus to help you there. And you know, this, uh, 
It's also important to remember that this sort of service is composed really well with other Azure Cloud services, like the scheduler particularly, and this is something that doesn't exist in Bizzle Server, you know, the scheduled task adapter, something that probably most Bizzle developers in the room have used at some point. Well, Azure Scheduler does all of that stuff. You know, that, that, that problem will be the message to kick something off. Well, now you can use the Azure Scheduler and you can say, you know, at 3 o'clock on a Sunday, I want to push a message into a bridge, and it'll kick off that, that processing, and, uh, you know, maybe it's going to then go do something else and look for the data, process it, and send it on to somewhere else. So, you know, don't just look at business services in isolation. There's a whole bunch of other things around it in Azure that can uh, that really compose together to create this integration platform in the cloud. If I take my existing uh, instance that I showed you earlier in the portal, which had no agreements or partners, uh, I'm just going to paste all this stuff in. Okay. And. Uh, Actually, it would help if I put things in the right boxes. I hope nobody's writing my secrets down because this isn't demo friendly, this dialogue, as we'll find out in a minute. Uh, so I'll quickly move on from that. Right, so what it's done is it's looked at my BizTalk server on premise database and said, hey, You've got these two partners, which ones would you like to move? So I can just select both of those, click next, and it's going to tick away, and uh, there you go. Move two partners to Azure. We'll look at that in a second. Then it's going to say, you've got some of these agreements. Do you want to move those? And I've got an agreement between Acme and uh, Widgets, so I'm going to move that as well. I want to click Next on that. Hopefully, I get a little tick next to that. I do. And I click Next. Two or two done. Right. So when I go back to the portal and let's have a look at this. Let this refresh. Right. Two partners, one agreement. OK. So again, you know, just quickly showing the tooling that I couldn't show earlier, showing the, how you can very easily move training partners <coughs> from one to the other. And there's an API behind this I'm sure other people are going to talk about, which you can, you can do it programmatically as well. So uh, just to really finish off then. So what makes sense to move? Well, you know, as I've hopefully been you know, explaining as I've been going, you know, it doesn't make sense to move everything. You know, maybe you've got data classifications on some of your systems on some of the data processing through those. It means you can't move to, uh, to a cloud-based platform. Uh, it depends where the message, you know, where the data is coming from and going to. You know, it makes no sense to take uh, two on-premise systems and connect them through business services, unless they're going to go to, a, you know, an endpoint out, out on the internet somewhere. You know, you wouldn't, you know, you may have latency requirements which are going to be blown out of the water if you start uh, you know, pushing everything, all your traffic out of your data centers, and all that data, and kind of pulling it all back in again just to connect to an on-premise system. Um, but you know, it's very useful. You know, the, the, the corollary of that is it's very useful to do cloud to cloud. So maybe. Um, it, from a security standpoint, you'd prefer not to bring data on premise that's coming from a third party and going to another third party, and you're just acting as an intermediary for that. You know, that's great because now you don't have to set up your firewalls and all the other stuff and provide infrastructure on premise. You can use BizTalk services to connect these two things together. And as I said, it's not all or nothing. You know, high grade integration patterns are important here, and I think they've become increasingly more important in how you connect different things together, BizTalk server and services particularly. Okay, right. So I can't uh, end there without throwing up a, a slide of the book. So this is coming uh, in, uh, later this month. Uh, we're literally uh, going through what's sort of called clumping, I think, where this file exercise where they kind of bolt all the chapters together and it goes off to the printers and printers. That should happen in the next week. And then it's sort of two or three weeks on from that. You know, you've seen it. See, it's already out there on Amazon pre-order already. Um, and this really covers, you know, BizLock services with... Um, with no prior knowledge, if you like. So it's called getting started. The idea, you know, if, it's, if you're a BizTalk developer, you'll get started very, very quickly. Even if you're not a BizTalk uh, um, developer or architect, it, you know, you'll understand the concepts very, very well. And as I said, I tried to cover one of the chapters of the book in this talk. Uh, you know, one nice thing, you know, I mentioned is we, we've managed to, uh, to get Vivek uh, Dalvi from the product group, you know, heads up the whole BizTalk product group to write a, a, a few words for us, as has um, Scott Guthrie. So, uh, yeah, so uh, go and uh, order it. Now. <laughs> right, whoops. So, thank you very much. And, uh, and <laughs>